Hello, my name is uh, Nick Vendegiesen. Uh, I'm professor of water resources management. Now, humanity faces several water challenges that need to be tackled within the coming generation. There is the continuing water and sanitation crisis, restoring and maintaining healthy aquatic ecosystems, and supplying the ever thirsty cities with sufficient water. The most chronic challenge, however, is the water for food challenge. How will we find enough water to produce the food that we need in the coming 30 to 40 years? In 2050, there will be 9 billion people to feed instead of the 7 billion people today. Increasing prosperity will further increase demand for food. In the coming 40 years, humanity will have to produce as much food as it has produced over the past 8,000 years. Presently, 70% of all the water that we extract for human usage is used to grow crops and raise cattle. In many places around the world, extraction of water for agriculture is under pressure from competing high-value usages such as industrial and urban development. We also want to protect our aquatic ecosystems, which further limits extractions for agricultural use. This holds especially for those areas where irrigated agriculture is most developed. North America, South and Southeast Asia, and Australia. In these areas, the amount of water available for agriculture will only decrease. In a nutshell, the challenge is to increase food production in 2050 by 40 to 80 percent, with 10 percent less water than we use for food now. So how much water does one need? Per day, we need to drink about three liters, or one cubic meter per year. This is not very much. So when we hear about droughts and people dying because of droughts, it's normally not because they do not have enough water to drink. Of course, water quality is always an issue, and water quality tends to be more acute in times of drought. For cooking, washing our food and pans, we need another five cubic meters per year. Again, not a very large number. For washing our bodies and clothes, we need 10 cubic meters per year. Water quality for washing needs to be reasonable, but not as high as for drinking water. Flushing toilets more or less doubles the water that we need in and around our households. There are important differences around the world, of course, with rural areas in developing countries using about 40 liters per day per person, and urbanized America about 200 liters per day. Again, the quantity of household water is rarely an issue, but quality is. We really see a big step when we look at how much water is needed to produce the industrial goods that we use. About 200 cubic meters per year is needed to produce the industrial good that we consume. Again, there are important gradients across the globe because of differences in consumption patterns, but 200 cubic meters per year is a good ballpark figure. The real jump comes from the water that we need for our food. It takes over 1,000 liters or kilograms of water to produce one kilogram of edible food. That means that even if we have a modest vegetarian diet, the amount of water needed for food dwarfs the amount of water that we need for other purposes. If we gear up our lifestyle, and it is expected that we all will improve our material well-being over the next generation, the amount of water needed rapidly increases. This is due to the fact that poor people are, generally, by necessity, near vegetarians. I grew up in a relatively money-poor family in the relatively rich Netherlands, and we would not eat meat every day, simply due to lack of financial resources. People really tend to eat more meat when their incomes improve. Animals are typically fed by vegetation that needs water to grow. Because we only consume the net production of meat, this takes a lot of water. And even in a country like India with a vegetarian diet preference, we see a clear increase in the consumption of dairy products when increasing incomes Partially, the increase in water consumption through animal products are misleading in areas where grass is the main feed and not enough rainfall is available to grow other crops. Still, we do not exaggerate when we say that the water needed to produce our food doubles when we add animal products to our diet. Biofuel is an interesting renewable alternative to fossil fuels. If, however, we would all decide to drive a car on biofuels using about 1,000 liters of fuel per year, we would almost double again the water needed to produce all the agricultural goods that we consume. Biofuels for cars may not be very likely, but for airplanes, biofuels seem the only carbon neutral alternative for decades to come. An intercontinental return flight takes about 300 liters of fuel per seat. Biofuels and bioplastics will add considerably to the total amount of water we need per person in 2050. So how can we increase our food production? In the past, especially during the 1970s, we were able to avoid mass starvation by the introduction of high-yielding varieties of, especially, wheat and rice. These improved varieties needed also increased inputs in the form of fertilizers and water. This graph shows how food scarcity drove up food prices, which, in turn,
triggered large investment in irrigation development. These investments clearly dropped following the drop in food prices and my own graduation as irrigation engineer in 1986. We see that over the past five years, food prices in real terms, that is inflation adjusted, are again as high as they were in the 1970s. It should be understood that the supply elasticity of food is low. One cannot simply increase acreages or productivities because land and water are limited resources. So it stands to reason that we will again see an increase in investment in irrigation. The final question then becomes, where will we grow all that food? This map from National Geographic shows production of cereal production around the world, with green showing high yielding areas and pale yellow low yielding areas. When you look at a map, first leave out all the areas that do not have enough water. North Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, East China, Central Australia and the western part of North America. Europe and North America are already producing at relatively high levels. The same holds for South, Southeast and East Asia. Actually in these areas agriculture stands under high pressure from urban and industrial development, especially when it comes to water. There are at least two major areas where food production can expand and where space, soils and climate are reasonably favorable. These are the savanna areas around the Amazon basin and the savanna areas around the Congo basin. Africa and South America are the only areas with the space and water resources to expand food production by 40% or more over the coming decades. To expand food production in these areas without overstretching the available water resources will be a major challenge indeed. For starters, we have very little data from these areas. This map clearly shows that in Africa and South America we have much less meteorological stations than elsewhere. To fill these gaps is a true scientific challenge that we need to face. Finally, we need investments. Large-scale irrigation has important social and environmental implications. Irrigation development over the past decades in Africa has shown mixed success. Small-scale village-level irrigation schemes like this one in Ghana tend to be better managed than larger schemes. The issue is that it's difficult to see how we can scale up such schemes. Presently, only about 2% of sub-Saharan agriculture is irrigated. To turn South America and Africa into the bread baskets of the world will be a truly global challenge. Thank you for your attention. Next time Dr. Marie-Claire Veldhaus will explain why we also need a lot of water for the city.